One pill makes you larger, and one pill makes you small. And the ones that the mother gives you uh, don't do anything at all. Ask Alice when she's ten feet tall. And if you go chasing rabbits, and you know you're going to fall, ask a hooker. Smoking caterpillar to give you the call, call Alice when she was just small. When the men on the chessboard get up and tell you where to go, and you just ate some kind of mushroom, and your mind is moving slow, ask Alice, I think she'll know. Logic and proportion <laughs> have fallen surely dead, and the white knight is talking backwards, and the red queen's on her head. Just remember what the dormouse said keep your head, keep your head. You know what? In that entire song, they don't mention the Mad Hatter. He was the best character in the entire book. Jefferson Airplane, what are you bloody doing? How about the Mad Hatter, eh? Anyway, Darren there, she's talking something about something. <laughs> <laughs>
If you're interested in um, Fortean literature and arcane zoological literature, you'll be familiar, or you will at least have heard of stories whereby eagles are said to have attacked and even killed and even carried off people, uh, mostly children, like famous married to Lex case of eighteen thirty-eight, but also sometimes adults. Um, are those stories a big part of nonsense, or do they have some basis in truth? Well, I actually think they have some basis in truth. We do now know that the golden eagle, which maximum mass can be about six kilos, golden eagles are capable of killing mammals that weigh over a hundred kilos. Uh, in particular, there's a case in New Mexico documented in 1996 where a pair of golden eagles took to killing cows, not big adult cows, calves, but they were the largest calf they killed weighed 115 kilos. They killed these animals by swooping down on, from the above, on them from above and, and smashing through the back of their heads with their giant talons. So, in view of that information, you know, it's pretty conceivable that a golden eagle could really take to kill a person if it wanted to, if it learned how to do that. You may be surprised to know that golden eagles are documented killers of such animals as coyotes, pronghorns, um, reindeer, uh, domestic sheep, and people have trained them in Mongolia to hunt wolves. There are wolf hunting golden eagles, they are called burkhuts. Um, we have evidence from the fossil record that big eagles killed early humans, the Australopithecines. The famous town child, or town baby, here shown with his discoverer, Professor Raymond Dart, who described this uh, key hominid fossil in 1925, it's been argued since by a number of authors, including Lee Berg here, it's been argued that the uh, damage marks on the town child's skull are evidence of an eagle attack. It's been proposed that this Australopithecine was actually killed by a large eagle, probably a crowned eagle. This is controversial. Some people contest the evidence for this, but it's an interesting thing that I've written about quite a bit. Um, I've written about um, the British big cat phenomenon. I am, you know, pretty confident that British big cats are a genuine phenomenon. Some of you won't find that at all. It's not a controversial, remarkable point of view. There's, a, there's very good photographic evidence. We have dead animals that have been captured, uh, that have been obtained in the country. And we have compelling um, carcasses of deer and other animals, like, like this one, particular, the Cooper Road in a carcass, which clearly were actually killed by big cats living wild in Britain. And many of you will be very familiar with the case of uh, recent times, whereby Max Blake, and um, Ross Barnett and myself and colleagues, we finally published our long-running research on this lynx, which Max discovered in the collections of the uh, Bristol City Museum and Art Gallery, or Bristol City Museum, whatever it's called at the moment. And um, this lynx was apparently shot in Devon, near Newton Abbott. Uh, Devon's, you know, somewhere down there. Um, and we did kind of, we kind of got inconclusive results, but we did everything that you could conceivably do on this specimen to try and work out what its geographical origin might have been, how long it was living in the wild, and so on. Our paper was published in Historical Biology earlier this year. Multiplinary investigation of a British big cat, a lynx killed in southern England, circa 1903. Max and I are signing copies for anyone who's bought their preprints or not. So I work on dinosaurs. And uh, something I've written about quite extensively are um, dinosaurs, uh, particularly dinosaurs of the Mesozoic, because dinosaurs obviously persisted beyond the Cretaceous, as, as you'll know. There are ex thousands of species of extant dinosaurs today. Um, and here's a pretty picture I did when I was a kid, I don't know, 1990 or something. And during the late 1980s and the early 1990s, many interested amateurs like myself were pretty convinced um, that even then, even as, you know, I wasn't a qualified researcher, but even then we thought the evidence was good that the bird-like dinosaurs we have here, these are mostly oviraptorosaurs, you'll notice that they are depicted as, as feathery, but there are things that aren't right here. This, the artistic style that I've shown here is very um, inspired by the um, artwork of American artist Gregory Paul, and Greg Paul's dinosaurs always have naked legs naked tails, naked fingers. And that's a kind of common motif that we see in feathery dinosaur pictures from this time, from 1988 to the early 1990s. Um, despite the fact that people like myself and many others were drawing dinosaurs with feathers in the 80s and 90s, it didn't really seep into mainstream consciousness. 
So um, if you Google Velociraptor, you get crap like this. You get the bloody Jurassic Park lizardy things. These are, these, are, these are the top hits for Velociraptor. There's, that one's got feathers, and that one's sort of got feathers, and I think that one has, but otherwise everything is a lizardy, scaly thing. And there's Ronald Reagan riding a giant Velociraptor into battle, which I'm sure must have happened at some point. Um, as you'll know, since about, I think, 1996, um, an enormous number of feathery dinosaurs have been discovered in Liaoning province in northwestern China, and these have clinched it. They've, they've, you know, case closed. We now know for a fact that all of the bird-like dinosaurs belonging to this group called the theropods, the predatory dinosaurs and the birds, we know that pretty much all smaller theropods were feathered. And they weren't feathered as in they just had like a few little feathers sticking off the top of the head or off the back of the arms. They were covered in feathers. Um, this is NGMC 91, also known popularly as Dave. And it has a thick, thick, thick covering of feathering all over the neck. It's got long feathers. Uh, you, you'd need detailed photos to appreciate this, but it's got long feathers on the forelimbs, on the hind limbs, and on the tail all over the body. Cordipteryx is famous for having long feathers on its hands and all over its body. Microraptor is insane for having these giant arm feathers that form wings, and also giant um, hind limb wings as well. It also has a big uh, showy plume at the tip of the tail that isn't shown in that picture. So these small feathery dinosaurs, velociraptor type dinosaurs, were covered in feathers. And you have to give up, give up totally on the idea that these animals were lizardy, dragony kind of scaly creatures. They, they look like birds. And in the artwork that's now absolutely accurate and contemporary, produced by people like John Conway, Emily Willoughby, Matt Martinuick, this is Velociraptor, this is Maylong, this is Truodont, these well, this is Cordipteryx. These well-known feathery dinosaurs, the fossils show that they look like stupid looking birds. If you saw these animals alive, you would think of them as kind of zany, giant, chicken -y things. They were not the scaly monsters of Jurassic Park. Matt Martinuick has just produced a volume titled A Field Guide to Species Like Birds and Other Winged Dinosaurs. Um, it's a... Uh, buy it online, I don't think it's available in bookshops, so Google Field Guide to Mises Over Birds if you're interested. This is actually a page from the book, it's one of the first field guides to Mises Over Dinosaurs, and, um, and you'll notice that you know, he's really showing these animals as looking very, very bird-like, and that's absolutely accurate based on what we now know from the fossil record. We've, so we've known for a while that the more bird-like of the theropods, the more bird-like of the predatory dinosaurs are fully feathered, but new finds have shown that members of some other theropod groups were fully feathered as well. So if we move away from birds in the theropod dinosaur family tree, there are a couple of other interesting groups we encounter, and one of them is the um, ostrich dinosaurs or ornithomimosaurs. As you can see from this one, this Canadian fossil, we have beautiful, complete um, uh, fossils of these things. And some recently discovered specimens have shown can you see these kind of little dark stripes across the forelimb bones? These are the poorly preserved bases of long arm feathers. Uh, this is a juvenile specimen of the ostrich dinosaur Ornithomimus, and uh, all, of, all along the, the back of the animal, the upper surface, adjacent to the vertebral column, there's long feathers all over the place as well. So ostrich dinosaurs covered in, uh, covered in um, uh, filament-like feathers and long feathers on the arms as well. Family tree of predatory dinosaurs do not worry about the details, but what I want to say is that the the, the birdy ones are kind of um, kind of sort of in this approximate region of the of the, the family tree. But recent finds are showing. I just, I just spoke of ostrich dinosaurs. Even if we go elsewhere in the theropod dinosaur family tree, where um, this is spinosaurs, the group that includes spinosaurs and megalosaurs, this. Uh, recently published dinosaur, published last year, called Sphuromimus, which means squirrel mimic. This is thought to be a baby spinosaur or megalosaur, and it also has evidence for this time they're not complex feathers, they are filament like feathers that form a dense, bushy tail, hence the Sphuromimus. Um, that image isn't coming up too good, but I hope you can make out. This is, a, this is Sphuromimus, another painting by Emily Willoughby. Um, Sphuromimus sat on a rock, on a beach. And uh, these little dinosaurs were covered in feathers. So fuzzy, thanks for that, 
uh, little spinosaur and megalosaur type theropod dinosaurs decked out in fuzzy structures as well. So these are the bird-like ones, they have definite veined complex feathers, ostrich dinosaurs, they have veined feathers, um, even down here, megalosaurs and spinosaurs, they have, we have evidence that they have filamentous feathers of some sort covering their bodies. Um, allosaur type things, the carcharodontosaurs, we have evidence from the fallen bones that some of these dinosaurs, so allosaur type big predatory dinosaurs, they may have had uh, feathery type structures, at least on their arms. Now, the dinosaur radiation, um, the, the, the predatory dinosaurs and birds are kind of in one big branch of dinosaurs, but there's another big branch of dinosaurs that includes the mostly herbivorous animals like Triceratops and relatives and Stegosaurus and relatives. And perhaps one of the most amazing things is we're now finding fossils that show feather-like structures in those, and they're called Ornithischians. So this is Cetacosaurus, it's a, a member of the horns dinosaur group, it's a relative of Triceratops and so on, and along the dorsal surface of its tail it's covered in bristles. This is Tianulon, a member of a group of Ornithischian dinosaurs uh, called Heterodontosaurids, and this also has bristles all over the tail, and specimens that are better than this one show the entire body thickly covered in a lustrous pelt. So, dinosaur family tree, this is a famous diagram produced by Paul Serino, Predatory dinosaurs over here, we've got abundant evidence of feathers and fuzz uh, widespread across this group. And in Ornithischians, we now have evidence for feathery, fuzzy structures here, and also uh, heterodontosaurids should be somewhere about here. So we now have some evidence for fuzz over here and fuzz over here, which suggests that it should be present in the dinosaur common ancestor. The only major group of dinosaurs that so far lack fuzz or feathers are sauropods, the giant long-necked dinosaurs. And the question is, did they actually have fossil feathers at some point in their evolution or in their life, or in their, um, life um, during their growth? Or did they really all have scaly skin? We don't know, we need more fossils. If you go through the dinosaur family tree, this is looking at the, the theropods, the predatory dinosaurs. I just want you to get the general gist here. This is time on this axis. This is a family tree of theropod dinosaurs. We see all the key features of birds evolving in stepwise fashion in predatory dinosaurs. So a three-fingered hand, large um, sternal plates that form these, this big breastbone that's characteristic of birds, uh, fully feathered wing, uh, the bird type shoulder girdle, blah blah blah, all these are the key features of birds all appear step by step by step in theropod dinosaurs until you end up with the most bird-like of theropod dinosaurs which are called the birds. Now, we increasingly are thinking, I would certainly argue, that the, the birds into dinosaurs, it really bugs me when pe people used to say that birds and dinosaurs are fundamentally different animals. They still are, they still are sort of, you, sh you should imagine them as different. No, you shouldn't. It's shades of grey, they totally grade into, into one another. And we would think of birds as being more dinosaur-like, if only we could see more readily some basic aspects of their anatomy, like their hands. This is a turkey wing, it shows how this is the ulna and the radius, the wrist here, and the hand. This just shows you how the hand folds backwards on the, on the, uh, the wrist joint. And ordinarily, a bird hand, you can still see three distinct fingers, but they've kind of fused together, and obviously, ordinarily, they're completely obscured by feathers, which makes the anatomy hard to discern. Uh, don't worry about the text. But you've probably heard that the Huatzin, or Huatzin, uh, written Huatzin, uh, this strange uh, leaf-eating um, South American bird, it's well known that as a juvenile this, this bird has large clawed fingers that it uses in climbing, as you can see in that old photograph. It's not the only bird that does this, there are some African seen like birds called turacos, which also will climb with their wing claws. But look at this, I mean that is a, that's a dinosaur's hand. During growth, the uh, Huatzin's uh, claws actually drop off, so in an adult uh, it doesn't have this, this obviously you know, clawed dinosaur type hand, but you get the impression that the Huatzin is unusual among birds, it is not. Hand claws are widespread in birds, and again you would appreciate this if only you got to see more dead birds. This is an ostrich hand, this is looking at the underside of the wing, and you can see claws. The, the animal has claws on its first digit, which is probably the thumb, second digit, the large claw. Um, we have wing claws there from gulls, swans, rails, quails, vultures. Um, and not only do birds often have clawed hands, they've also evolved a whole bunch of really neat uh, 
spikes and clubs and other structures on their hands that they use as weapons. Um, this is a, uh, a horned uh, screamer, uh, a South American bird, vaguely related to, uh, it's a member of the waterfowl group, related to ducks and geese and swans. And this is famous for having these big dagger-like weapons on its wings, which it uses in combat. They're actually detachable, um, which means that when these birds stab each other with their um, wing daggers, they sometimes snap off and are left lodged in the tissues of opponents. And you can see a variety of other amazing daggers and clubs present on the hands of other birds, including plovers, like lapwings, jacanas, that's lily trotters. Um, this is a recently extinct uh, Jamaican ibis called Zenis ibis, or Zenis ibis, whatever you prefer. That's the uh, wing of a normal ibis, the American white ibis, and this is a Zenis ibis wing, and it's carpometacarpus, which means the hand part of its skeleton has evolved into this giant, thick-boned, club-like structure, or flail, which um, Nick Longridge and Storz Olsen have argued was actually used as a bashing weapon, that uh, it may have used this in self-defense to fight off whichever predators it encountered, or more likely it was a intraspecific combat device, so it was, they were fighting among themselves when, you know, I don't know, during the mating season or whatever. This is the solitaire, a very close relative of the dodo, um, endemic to Rodriguez in the Indian Ocean, famous for having a pronounced amount of sexual dimorphism. Males are much bigger than females, and males are famous for having these giant big gnarly lumps on the hand and the lower arm. What you're looking at here is the left side of the bird with the upper arm, the humerus up here, the lower arm up here, the wrist region is here, and the hand is folded away down here. And can you see these big bony lumps? In life, these would have been covered by big um, keratinous um, like knobs, so they would have been even bigger. And there are eyewitness accounts where people spoke about these birds clattering their wings loudly and whacking the hell out of each other during combat. Now if we go back to the bird-like dinosaurs I was talking about, if those of you familiar with Velociraptor and, and related kinds of dinosaurs, Deinonychus, Euteraptor, Truidon, they're famous for having this giant, what we call hyperextended, that means held well up off the, uh, the, 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 uh, the floor, this giant hyperextended claw on the second toe of the foot. Digit 1 is the short one there, digit 2, digit 3, digit 4. And what is this giant sickle-like claw four. It's compressed from side to side, it's really big, it's obviously strongly curved, and the idea that's been most popular among paleontologists is that it was a, a ripping and slashing weapon. As you can see in this piece of art by Mike Skrepnik, here we have a uteraptor ripping the belly out of a sauropod. The sauropod's guts are literally spinning out onto the ground, and that's kind of the preferred idea as to how these animals kill uh, predators, uh, kill prey even. But is this does this actually work? And the short answer is no. The long answer is that a bunch of researchers led by Phil Manning constructed a robot with a sickle claw and they, um, they got it to attack tissue. Um, there are some issues with their study that I won't discuss now, take too long, but they basically couldn't really get the sickle-like claw to actually properly rip through tissue. It would tend to just get stuck. When we look at living um, birds, living birds of prey, and I'll make the point here that many things that we all think that everybody knows have never been studied. They just haven't been investigated. And the predatory behavior of modern predatory birds is tremendously understudied. Very little work actually done on linking the anatomy of the birds to the style of predation they use. When we look at the anatomy of living predatory birds, we see in quite a few of them, here we have a goshawk, a red-tailed hawk, and a peregrine. You see some, some of them have got really big, uh, especially big claws on digit two. In birds, digit one, the small digit there in the Dinonychus foot, digit one has become enlarged and reversed relative to the other digits. It's now fully opposable. That isn't the case in this animal. But um, that's digit one there. Digit two, this giant big claw. Well, how do these birds use this big digit two claw? Because it seems very similar to the condition present in Velociraptor, Dinonychus, and so on. The answer is it's a restraining device. They seem to leap on top of things, pin them down. They use the giant sickle claw to actually like hold the thing in place while they eat it. And it dies by being eaten. It's not dispatched quickly with a, a clean slice to the neck. They don't break its neck. They just eat it until it dies. So there's a sparrow hawk doing that trick on an unfortunate magpie. Another brilliant Emily Willoughby illustration of a Deinonychus eating a small ornithopod dinosaur. 
These velociraptor type dinosaurs, they, despite what it says in Jurassic Park, they don't have super long legs, they're not super speedy animals, they've actually got fairly chunky, stocky legs, which probably means they're actually pretty good at remaining balanced on top of an animal while they were like pinning the civil claw into it. And it's even been argued that the uh, evolution of wing-like forelimbs may actually have assisted them in like staying, keeping their balance on top of a struggling prey animal as they, uh, as they dispatch it, as they kill it. You'll notice again a very, very bird-like rendition of uh, these predatory dinosaurs, which is absolutely accurate in view of what we know from the fossil record. So goodbye to the old idea of scaly lizard-like um, predatory dinosaurs that rip open the flanks of uh, other dinosaurs. Hello to the bird-like version that uh, restrains things and eats it while it's screaming and kicking and uh, um, generally trying to avoid a nasty death. Um, the predatory dinosaurs that, we've just, that I've just been talking about, Velociraptor and their relatives, they are part of this major group here, to the Dromaeosaurids. The Dromaeosaurids are very closely related to a similar but kind of skinnier, more lightly built group called the Truodontids. If you know anything about dinosaurs, if you've ever read a dinosaur book, your Truodontids are famous for being... I would swear, I'd love to swear right now, for having big brains. So, um, it's been said that Truodon has this really big brain for a dinosaur, and this means it was the smallest dinosaur ever. And this explains why in the Jurassic Park book, and eventually in the films, we, have, we get to the stage where the dinosaurs are able to open doors and do Sudoku and crossword puzzles. In actual fact, uh, you know, let's start by saying we have some really, really horrible, scaly skinned models here. But um, in actual fact, you know, the brain size of Trudon is about comparable to that of an opossum or a chicken. So it might have been smart compared to a house brick, but it wouldn't have been an intelligent animal. It wouldn't have been able to open doors and, and uh, such. But inspired by the so called, in quotes, big brains of these animals, a paleontologist called Dale Russell hypothesized that had Truodontids not become extinct at the end of the Cretaceous, they would have evolved into humanoid dinosaurs or dinosauroids. And this famous model, which you may have seen, was constructed by a model maker and artist, Ron Seguin. I have no idea how to pronounce his name, but that'll do. And, uh, and he made this so called humanoid dinosaur based on the premise that if true and evolved a bigger brain over time, it would inevitably evolve into humans, because humans are the bestest animals ever. Um, this idea won't die. It's still around. It's, it's in books. Whenever true adopted to mention, it's always there. This is John Civic's illustration. Reminds me of the creatures from V. And from also, you, you'll notice there's a kind of familiar motif to these things. You know, there have been humanoid reptiles throughout the world of science fiction and the uh, interesting world of David Icke and so on. And um, this is a model, a, a suit of a dinosaur that appeared in the TV series called Dinosaur Exclamation uh, Mark uh, on TV in 1991. And those of you who watch a lot of children's television may be aware of Dino Sapien. Okay, it's Homo sapiens with an S on the end. So you don't say Robo Sapien, Dino Sapien, those are all wrong. God. Um, it should be Dino Sapien or something like that. But there's, the whole idea of Dino Sapien is that uh, a girl called Lauren, played by Brittany Wilson, meets a smart dinosaur who's still hanging out in the wild somewhere in Canada. And there they are, high-fiving one another or something. And, so, and there's a few feathers on here. It's got kind of some crazy hairdo going on. But in general, this is still, it's still the green, scaly, lizardy type monster of decades past. Um, the whole idea that Truodontids or any dinosaurs would evolve into humans, number one, hinges on the assumption that there's something inevitable about the human body shape. And given what we know about evolutionary history, about our own evolutionary history, I would regard that as very problematic. There's no reason to take that seriously at all. We are the body shape we are because of our own evolutionary history. You know, we've evolved from a group of primates that evolved this body shape through due to going to like a cautious climbing phase, a brachiating phase, and eventually a bipedal walking phase, blah, blah, blah. And number two, it ignores the fact that Truodontids and other Manoraptoran theropods, these bird-like predatory dinosaurs, they were feathered bird-like animals. If they continued evolving, well, maybe they could have evolved big brains. There are big brain birds. There are, there are parrots whose brains are as big as those of some primates, um, in proportional terms. But they, they, we would have seen more 
you know, we would have seen feathery, big brain things. Again, you should imagine Geodontis is looking like, like this, various reconstructions here. So a smart, big-brained truodontid, had it evolved, would not look like a scaly green humanoid. It would look something like that, which is a creature that we've called Avis sapiens sorophius, invented by my good friend and colleague Mehmet Kozman. Um, and the, I, this, this has been revisited several times on Tetrapod Zoology. Google smart dinosaurs if you want to know any more about it. Already this model, which was done a few years ago, is now looking out of date because new finds have shown that we should not have scaly hands in these animals. We should have feathers growing off their fingers, and we probably should have feathers on the hind limbs as well. And these feathery dinosaurs were decked out in feathers all over the place. So, moving away from dinosaurs for the time being, and looking instead at uh, something very different, complex and unexpected behaviour in uh, living reptiles, something I've also got a special interest in. You probably know that crocodilians, that's gharials, crocodiles and alligators, um, they build nests, they exhibit extensive post-hatching parental care, which means that they will actually, once the baby's hatched, they'll like dig them out of the nest and they'll carry the babies down to the water and they'll look after the babies. That's all quite well known. But we're finding lots more interesting stuff that's making these animals more and more complex the more we learn. We now know about cooperation between non-related individuals in crocodiles and caimans. We, we know that at least some species actually seem to feed their babies. Uh, several uh, bits of footage and, and film showing uh, crocodilians of various species actually apparently feeding babies, which, which among archosaurs, that's crocodilians, dinosaurs, birds, all those things, that was thought to be unique to birds, it clearly isn't. We know of cases where babies are adopted and, as, and assumed into a clutch of, um, uh, into, a, into like a group of, um, uh, that includes younger individuals. Some, there seems to be some kind of, I don't want to anthropomorphise it, but there seems to be some tendency among crocodilians to like take care of individuals, even those that aren't, that aren't their own. Play behaviour and tool use are now known for crocodilians. The tool use thing is absolutely ridiculous. It's in press at the moment, so I can't really talk about it. Um, it's being uh, written up by uh, Vladimir Binets. Um, now, so, so we know that crocodilians do all this complex stuff, but some of these things are actually fairly widespread in other reptiles as well. So it turns out that, that um, colonial nesting and extensive post-hatching parental care, care of babies, is proving to be quite widespread in lizards. And uh, a study published this year has documented for the first time post-hatching parental care in turtles. And in this particular case, the babies were making noises in the shells, the parents made noises back, there seemed to be like a back and forth, and when the babies hatched they followed the parents, the parents continued vocalising and the parents led them to, uh, on, a, on a particular kind of migration trajectory. So, complex social behaviour all over the place in lizards and possibly turtles. Recent studies have shown that at least some lizards are far more intelligent, again in quotes, than people often thought. So this is a green anole, and it's able to discriminate within just a few trials to quickly learn which of these uh, uh, badge-like tabs to collect when there's a food reward. I don't think a few years ago that people seriously would have entertained the idea that lizards were that trainable, that clever. Um, Social Life of the Green Iguana, I've read an article that I quite like called Amazing Social Life of the Green Iguana, and it's all about the, um, the very interesting um, social behaviour present in juveniles. They emerge from the nest altogether, they, they, they keep a lookout for other babies emerging from other nests, and they, they basically look around for danger, and then they all emerge from the nest together. And then the larger babies, which are normally the male ones, they will actually lead their brothers and sisters to a safe place. They'll all sleep together in a pile. And on the place where this has been studied, Slothia Island in Panama, the leader baby iguanas um, groomed the smaller ones. Actually, they literally went and licked parasites off their bodies and stuff like that. They engaged in lots of head rubbing and body rubbing, which is kind of you know a friendly thing. Think of cats and other animals, they do this. And when the, um, at, when the leader baby was taking the others to a body of water they had to cross, the leader would go back and check that the, his brothers and sisters were following it and make sure they caught up. There is even a, a study showing um, fraternal care in baby green iguanas. So they flew model hawks 
at baby green iguanas, and brothers would see the hawk coming, so far as we understand, they see the hawk coming, and they deliberately run in front of their sisters and hide them with their own bodies, the males being larger than the females, they can obscure them. And I think this is pretty incredible stuff. Green iguanas have a complex body language, they do loads of like head nodding and push-ups and displaying of the dewlap and the crest and so on. They are lecking animals, which means that males form these like display stands. The females move from display stand to display stand, checking out the males, seeing who they might want to mate with. And there are sneaky little males that pretend to be kind of, I don't know, females and they kind of sneak in and take advantage of her. They, they, they avoid the attentions of the big aggressive male because they look kind of like female-like. Going back to crocodiles, did you know that um, crocodiles have now, on at least, I think, four occasions, been documented grabbing the trunks of elephants? The fact that it's been seen and documented three or four times, I mean, it's been photographed or filmed three or four times, means that it must occur, I think, more than three or four times in the history of life. It's, it's apparently occurred fairly often. This is a real danger to elephants. It may explain why we sometimes see elephants like this one with missing trunk tips. This elephant actually learned to um, get water into his mouth by squirting out the damaged tip of the trunk. And one of the things, as a paleontologist, that I always like to think about is if this stuff goes on today, come on, it must have happened in the past as well. So here we have a completely speculative and groundless illustration showing the fossil elephant Platybelodon being trunk grabbed by a giant African croc called the Euthycodon. This must have happened in the past. Um, Google crocodiles attack elephants for more. I know some people that don't like watching this stuff because they actually find it quite upsetting. Um, I've written extensively about the crocodile family tree, trying to work out how these animals are related to one another. And a really cool thing that's emerged over the last few years is the fact that the Nile crocodile isn't one species anymore. Um, the, there's a bunch of crocodiles now known to have been present, now known to be present across basically the whole of the northern half of Africa. Initially, they were thought to be restricted entirely to the northeast, but uh, someone's called the sacred crocodile, probably the Sucus. Then this this separate population is not part of the Nile crocodile; it's a separate species. So, in the cladogram, in the family trees that people generate by looking at you know DNA evidence, molecular evidence, they find that the Nile crocodile proper is most closely related to the New World crocodiles. The several species of crocodiles that inhabit the Caribbean and tropical uh, South America and tropical North America, whereas the sacred crocodile is the closest relative of this clade of these guys, the Nile crocodile plus the, the American crocs. Um, so what does this mean? Well, if this animal is present throughout Africa, as is the Nile crocodile, these ones must, at some point, have gotten to the Americas from Africa. So they must have crossed the Atlantic. Now, crocodiles, despite what any preconceptions you may have, crocodiles are young. They are geologically young. These species evolved within the past several million years. They haven't been hanging around since the age of dinosaurs. You know, that stuff is, is just not accurate. And a couple of million years ago, the Atlantic was wide. A little bit narrower than it is today, but still very wide. So, at some point, close relatives of the Nile crocodile crossed the Atlantic Ocean to get to the Americas. Um, as I say here, Crocodilus sucus, this so-called sacred crocodile, initially assumed to be a relic species of arid North and West Africa. It has since been documented in Uganda and Ethiopia. So, far more widespread than we ever thought. Um, living crocodiles are the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the diversity of a far more inclusive group that we call the Crocodiliformes, or Crocodilomorphs. Crocodilomorphs is like all of these things, Crocodilum forms is a subgroup. And as you can see in this picture, some of you will have seen that on my famous business card already. Actually, not a business card, a thing, the card. Um, yeah, there's loads of these animals. The diversity in fossil crocodiliforms is crazy. There are gigantic animals, like we've got Sarcosuchus in Perital there and Parasaurus. These animals were more than 10 meters long. Giant seagoing crocs, the Meteorinkids with with fish-like tails and flippers, loads of terrestrial, sometimes predatory, sometimes omnivorous, sometimes herbivorous crocs that were really abundant, particularly during the Cretaceous and also during the early part of the Cenozoic. There were big predatory um, quadrupedal terrestrial ones like the Sebacosuchians. And, and these animals, crocodilomorphs, are part of an even more inclusive group, the crocodile group Archosaurs. 
Um, the earlier ones, of which were really a really big deal in the Triassic, really successful in the Triassic, before dinosaurs really got going, they include giant terrestrial um, quadrupedal and bipedal herbivores, omnivores, and um, uh, herbivores, omnivores, and carnivores called Brausukians, giant armor-plated things called Aetosaurs. Um, th there's a huge dynasty of, of numerous species, numerous lineages back in the Triassic. Um, I'm really pleased with the fact that I managed to get my crocodile crocodilithal montage into a museum display uh, in Florida. And I just want to touch briefly on the fact that there are loads of groups of organisms that we don't really ever hear about. They're only really, you know, it's always dinosaurs, dinosaurs, dinosaurs. There are loads of other groups of animals that don't get any coverage at all, including all those fossil crocodiliforms. These remarkable, diverse amphibian-type animals called the temnospondyls. Again, okay, that lady isn't exactly to scale, but some of these things were stupendously big. Um, some of them look ridiculous, like plate of high strips, this kind of sail-backed uh, temnospondyl, this stupid frog-headed thing, Gorotherax. Um, temnospondyls, a big deal between the Carboniferous and uh, Triassic, Jurassic, they're just about making it into the Cretaceous. They may include the ancestors of modern amphibians, that's still controversial. Um, ichthyosaurs, marine reptiles that are shaped like um, sharks or dolphins, really important during the Triassic, Jurassic and Cretaceous. Um, yeah, <laughs> I work with uh, uh, my good friends Jeff Liston and Valentine Fisher, and we are together the uh, building the ichthyosaur revolution. Um, what about mammals? There's mammals. Um, during the Cenozoic, South America was an island continent, was inhabited by a fantastic pantheon of bizarre, unfamiliar mammals, predatory marsupials or marsupial relatives called the Boraenoids. Uh, the most familiar of them is Thalacosmilus. This is a marsupial type animal that has evolved to mimic a saber toothed cat, but it's not a cat, it's a predatory marsupial or marsupial like mammal, and they're a dog like and bear like and climbing civet like Boraenoids as well. Cenozoic South America was stuffed full of amazing megafauna. There are giant predatory birds like the forest wakids. There are giant hippo-like things like the toxodontids. There are bizarre big elephant-type things like the astrapathies, as well as those terrestrial crocs, so the Kasukians, blah, 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 many others, giant slates. Where can you read about these animals? What do you want to do if you want to read about them? Well, nowhere. <laughs> um, this is pretty much the only book the only book that reviews South American Cenozoic megafauna, Splendid Isolation, written by George Gaylord Simpson, um, published a few years ago. It's now a bit out of date, but um, I think there's, you know, these animals need more love. They need more, you know, forget dinosaurs. Everybody's heard of dinosaurs. Do the other animals, for Christ's sake. Um, I've worked fairly extensively on Asdarkids, these remarkable gigantic pterosaurs. Now I'm really running out of time now, so I'm going to speed through this real quickly. Uh, some of these animals were as big as giraffes when walking on the ground. There's been controversy over how they lived, lots of different ideas, most of which are retarded to astronomically retarded. Um, myself and my colleague Mark Whitten have argued that they most likely were what we call terrestrial stalkers, that they actually, their fossil record shows that they were um, uh, strongly associated with terrestrial continental environments. They're, based, they're strongly adapted for walking around on all fours, like um, the, their closest analogues are, are things like marabou stalks and ground hornbills. They're probably walking around, picking up dinosaurs, lizards, basically anything they want to eat. And remember how big they are, they can swallow big things. A few years ago, when I was based at the University of Portsmouth, where I am no longer there, but we hosted, on the South Bank in London, we hosted this exhibition devoted to pterosaurs. We had this outside um, uh, installation of life-size as dark and pterosaurs. Quetza, she has a baby sauropod in her mouth, and Bamofo, <laughs> such a funny name, Ask me about it later. But Mofo, this big male one, and we had some flying ones overhead. For some reason, that was given roundels, something to do with the Battle of Britain. Um, so, Mark Whitten and David Martill, my colleagues at the University of Portsmouth, made these brilliant models, tons of publicity surrounding these. Um, I've worked on several of dark kids lately. I do feel work in Romania, and we found these various bits and pieces that belong to a new kind of as dark kid from Romania that we called Euras Darko. Compared to the giant ones, like Hatsodotrix, it's tiny. It's only, in quotes, has a wingspan of three meters. 
But this, we actually know that these giant ones and these middle-sized ones were actually living alongside one another in the same fauna. This is a reconstruction showing a big one and little ones. Um, and of course this idea is fairly familiar in living fauna. So you sometimes have species packing, different species doing, you know, fulfilling different ecological niches in different parts of the environment. Uh, these are two kinds of egrets. Uh, I don't know, a snow egret or a little egret and a great egret living alongside one another, widging for scale. And if we look at the skulls that we have of those darkids, for example, these Texan ones that were contemporaneous, different jaw shapes, again, indicate different specializations for different lifestyles. So we're seeing what's called niche partitioning in those darkened pterosaurs. This seems to be a widespread pattern. We've got this all over the world. We have some really exciting new Asdarkid research that's due to be published fairly soon because we have new elements of giant Asdarkids, ones that are this kind of size. Um, I can't talk about it yet, but they will kind of change some of the ideas that we have about Asdarkid anatomy and behaviour. Asdarkids, like Quetzalcoatlus, were living in the same fauna as familiar dinosaurs like Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops. And there's, again, a sort of popular but misguided idea out there that these animals were um, kind of, maybe they weren't so good at looking after themselves. They had to fly away at the sight of a predator. But in actual fact, remember firstly that predators are not indestructible superheroes that see any, that they're not like the, animal, the Spinosaurus in Jurassic Park. They don't just like see something and smash through a giant barrier to get to eat it. They're generally cowardly, lazy, conservative, they tend to attack the, uh, attack the same things again and again because they know they can take it on. They, they always go for the easy option. They need the little baby instead of the big strong adult. Um, so if Tyrannosaurus is walking around and it sees a big cancer wireless, is it really going to take it on? I, I don't know, that's kind of doubtful. That's, what is his name? Bundius Cumbersnatch or whatever he's called, the guy who played <laughs> Khan in Star Trek, the, the Star Trek Into Darkness. What's his name? Benedict Cumberpatch. Um, <laughs> whatever. A lot more diversity in pterosaurs than people appreciate. Asdarkids are the weirdest of the lot. You know, there's nothing like an asdarkid to steal words from my, my colleague Mark Whitten. And you'll see other pterosaurs. Yeah, there's lots of variation there. And a plug for Mark's book, uh, Mark Whitten, Pterosaurs, the best book yet written on pterosaurs. Check it out if you're interested in the diversity of extinct animals. I published another pterosaur this year, Vecti Draco from the Isle of Wight, named after the girl who found it. She was four when she found it, Daisy Morris. And it's a pelvic uh, region and associated vertebrae. And this really is the opposite size of the size spectrum from animals like this big as dark. This animal's tiny, it's, it's got a wingspan of about a metre, kind of the size of a gull, a large gull. And by the way, all of the papers that I've just mentioned are available free online. They're, they're all published in PLOS One. So uh, that's a totally open access, free to anyone journal, that the Vecti Draco paper, the U.S. Darko paper, and the paper that Mark and I did on Asdarkid paleobiology in the first place. Um, I mentioned the All Yesterday's project. I've got the All Yesterday's book here. Now, myself working together with John Conway and, and Memo Kozman, we kind of wanted to do a dinosaur book that's different from all the others. Living animals are really weird, there's loads of crazy stuff happens, things that we wouldn't predict if we knew about them from fossils. Let's explore this more speculative aspect of paleontology in a book. Um, we got a lot of publicity, io9 did a really good article on the book, The Daily Fail. Um, what did they say? The book that can change the way we see dinosaurs, we think of them as sleek and fierce. What if they were fat and furry and here to steal our benefits? Said the male. <laughs> there's this... <laughs> There's this general tendency, historically, to imagine, certainly in recent years, since the dinosaur revolution, since the 1960s, to imagine dinosaurs as, as zombie-like creatures. You can look at these poor sunken creatures, you can see all the cavities in their skulls, and this Ellie Kish painting, you can see even the cavities between the sides, you know, the sides of the, the, the neck vertebrae, this giant trough that presumably filled it with water or pterosaur dung. Um, and is this accurate when we look at living animals? This, we call this shrink wrapping, when you put the absolute minimum amount of soft tissue onto a fossil animal. Shrink wrapping is not restricted to dinosaurs, people have shrink wrapped fossil mammals as well. Look at these poor zombie saber toothed cats. Zombie saber toothed cats. This bizarre reconstruction published by Miller. There are fossil dogs, that's a fossil dog called Barophagus, that have been shrink wrapped as well. So we need. 
uh, most things in nature aren't black or white, they're shades of grey somewhere in the middle. And we need to, you know, the pendulum swings too far one way or the other. We don't want super skinny shrink wrap dinosaurs, we don't want big fat lardy behemoths like some of the Charles Knight dinosaurs. We want somewhere in the middle. What if we applied this shrink wrapping technique to modern animals? Well, these are the kind of results. Various illustrations here by uh, my friend Cameron McCormick and others. That's what a cat looks like, but you know, if some, some artists of fossil animals would actually you know, look at the skeleton, that's kind of what you'd get up with, get, you'd get. Um, a shrink wrapped chicken, a cat, a horse, reconstructed in the, in the style of the, the, the great American artist Gregory Paul. What kind of stuff do we have in all yesterdays? Well, we shrink wrapped some modern animals. So a baboon, you know, if we only knew about it as a fossil, and if we didn't really know anything about the soft anatomy of mammals, you have to imagine that we, you know, imagine that this is being done by non-mammalian, non-human paleontologists in the future. Um, would they imagine a baboon looks like that? It's a shrink wrapped baboon. It's got to be venomous because baboons have got giant canals on the outside of their teeth, clearly for conducting venom. Swans clearly were some giant sort of dinosaur type things with giant scythe-like hands that they probably used as stabbing weapons. Um, and various other ideas explored in the book. Um, some dinosaurs must have looked ridiculous, must have looked stupid because living animals do. Some dinosaurs, I'm pretty sure, got up with some uh, inappropriate behaviour on occasion because living animals do. After all, look at the living world. Rule number one, living animals are freaking ridiculous. There are animals that are like hot water bottles, monkeys that can walk, sloths that climb into toilets and eat poo, weedy sea dragons, there's snowy owls, and what the hell is that? <laughs> Rule number two, I do know what it is, it's a bird of paradise. Living animals do freaking ridiculous things. Hippos bite crocodiles to death, chameleons jump out of trees, giraffes sleep with their heads on the ground, pelicans eat pigeons, herons eat rabbits, greaves run across the surface of the water, monkeys dive, elephants. Uh, mine, humans surf, the hell, and there are birds that drop from the sky at 200 miles per hour. So these old traditional ideas of dinosaur life, depicting animals living lives where all they do is fight, kill and eat one another, these are tropes and memes, stop doing the same thing, stop it, stop it now. Now uh, a key component of um, uh, paleontology is speculation. and. Uh, ordinarily, it is a, a, a completely understandable, acceptable, forgivable amount of speculation. For example, we have these giant troughs preserved on a fossil Jurassic seafloor from Switzerland. Having considered all the options, the only thing we have left is that these uh, troughs were made by large marine reptiles like pliosaurs trawling along the seafloor. Um, hunting for prey and, and creating these enormous troughs, some of which are many metres long. Sometimes we think we confidently identify something from a small uh, bit of the skeleton. We don't take a single bone like a toe bone and build a whole skeleton. That's a popular misconception. Nobody does that. But if you think you've identified something properly, you can make inferences about what the whole thing was like. So a few years ago, I was confronted with a fossil jaw that seemed to be from a giant bird called it's Sanrukia. Oops. And... Um, we don't know if it's flying or flightless, but you know, here's some reconstructions of San Ruki. It turns out I was completely wrong. It's the lower uh, jaw of a pterosaur, so it wasn't a giant bird at all. But I would still say that is a justifiable speculation based on, what, on the fossil we have. Sometimes people have made speculations about animals that might have existed, or even definitely existed, but we haven't yet found them as fossils. Some of you may know what this is, a long and complex story. It looks like a nightmarish creature from hell, or possibly from the Henson movie, The Dark Crystal. This is a protobat. There must have been protobats. There must have been animals that were intermediate between shrew-like early Laurasia fears and true bats, but we haven't yet found their fossils. They must have looked something like that at some point. Now, if you're interested in, uh, in paleontology, in speculation, Everybody who's interested in this stuff combines it with an interest in what we call speculative zoology. And of course, the um, I'm reckoning like another five, ten minutes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, he says optimistically. Um, Dougal Dixon's books. Put your hands up if you're familiar with Dougal Dixon's books. Yeah, that's a pretty good show. Thank you very much. Um, the, there's a trilogy. After Man is the best known one. The idea is that we are looking at the the Earth as it is. I, I think it's 50 million years in the future. And Dougal came up with a whole pantheon of 
of uh, uh, possible future creatures. He did one called the New Dinosaurs, and the idea there is that the end Cretaceous extinction event never happened, and all of the Cretaceous dinosaur and pterosaur and marine reptiles have persisted to the present. It's interesting, but it's the least good of the three, because many of his ideas about what could have happened I, I don't think are very plausible. And the last one, Man After Man, I think is potentially the most interesting. The idea is that in the future, humanity has wiped out everything interesting. The world is pretty much devoid of large animals. But because humans are in the man after man future, because they are whizzes at um, surgical modification and genetic modification, they actually take surviving human populations and modify them genetically to fit the environments that they've now managed to reconstruct on Earth. Um, they, bas they basically mould humans to different environments. And then the rest of the book, the rest of Man After Man, is based on the, the natural evolution of these different um, uh, genetically created uh, human, um, modified humans. Some of the more uh, famous creatures from, from the trilogy, I haven't shown the Night Stalker there, but I had that early in the book. That's this giant um, bipedal predatory bat. Um, kind of similar to Sebulba from the new Star Wars movies. It walks on its hands and walks on its hands and uses its prehensile feet to do stuff. The Lank is a giraffe-like pterosaur from the new dinosaurs and interestingly really ties in very nicely with some of the stuff I showed earlier on about as darker pterosaurs because we've actually learned that in some respects as darker pterosaurs weren't a million miles away from this kind of creature in terms of terrestrial ability. They weren't grass cropping herbivores. Um, this is the vortex, a giant, fully aquatic, planktivorous whale. That's the paw pin. Uh, Dubodixon imagined various penguin derivatives that take the role of marine mammals in the future oceans. Acudens ferox is a saber-toothed uh, predatory human from man after man. These are gigantelopes that evolve on the continent of Lemuria, which splits off from the east coast of Africa in the future of um, after man. <laughs> That seems to be something that's really happening, by the way. There's, uh, there's increasing evidence for uh, rifting of a long, um, slither-like continent that's actually breaking away from the eastern side of Africa, moving out to the Indian Ocean. And what's this one called? The Sand Puppy or something? Lancha. Sand? La huh? Lancha. Lancha, thank you very much. Sand Puppy is actually a, a, a real alternative name for the naked mole rat. Uh, but the Lancha is kind of like a mole rat-like predatory thing. and. Those of you who've read my April Fool's articles will know that I actually involved this in a hypothetical evolutionary scenario that ends in the uh, Mongolian death world. Um, inspired by Dewar Dixon's creatures, I have, of course, like many people interested in stuff, come up with my own crazy stuff. So on Tetrapod Zoology, I've written about an imaginary parallel timeline called the Swamazoic, populated by all kinds of creatures. And if you do this properly, you know, you have to come up with um, a whole packet of imaginary species, and you have to come up with evolutionary uh, scenarios and anatomical details, and, and you have to like color the creatures and come up. And then, and then before you know it, people start um, um, uh, uh, other other people start producing their own um, um, their own like fan art of this stuff, which is why there are color images produced by other people. Now this brings us to cryptozoology because a key component of um, cryptozoology, I think, is a, a massive amount of speculation about the kind of evolutionary trajectories of some of the cryptids that authors have endorsed. Now partly, I would say, this is, as I said for paleontology, partly this is understandable and appropriate, but in other cases, you know, people have gone too far, should we say. For example, Bernard Hoevermans in his nine species um, classification system for sea serpents, he comes up with this fairly elaborate scenario for how bacillosaurid whales, these long-bodied whales of about 45 million years ago, of how they evolved armour and uh, the armour became elaborated into giant um, metallic plates that cover the animal and you know, he comes up with like a specific evolutionary scenario for these animals. Now by the time you've... So there's like a several step process in cryptozoology where you come up with a, a creature based on a body of eyewitness accounts, you then ascribe certain like, you know, anatomical and behavioural characteristics to it, and then you, can, then you um, add on uh, speculations about its evolutionary biology, its history, um, 
it's, it's possible that ecology, you know, Hoefelman's even, even discussed the idea about ecological interaction between some of these, some of these sea serpent species. And um, I think if you remember the core body of evidence that we have, that often is going way too far with, with the actual quality of the evidence we have. Of course, there is an enormous amount of speculative literature as well on um, some of the crypto hominids. This is a rendition of the, the Homo pongoides creature, um, the, the uh, East Asian creature that, as you know, uh, uh, Bernard Hoverman and Ivan Simerson and uh, uh, Boris Porchner uh, wrote about and, and kind of believed was depicted. They, they believed this was a modern descendant of Neanderthals. Uh, Hoverman's and Porchner wrote the book uh, L'homme Neanderthal est toujours vivant, um, saying, you know, but again, coming up with quite an elaborate evolutionary historical scenario for the evolution of this creature. Is the core evidence on which this whole scenario is based, is the core evidence robust enough for you to really, you know, be confident that that stuff should stand? And that's arguable. Based on the success of all yesterday's myself and the fat one there, Mehmet and John, we decided to do our next book on cryptozoology. It will be published later this year. It's called the Cryptozoologicon. And we are including brief reviews of what we know about certain cryptids. We're coming up with our own um, kind of conclusions as to their likelihood and what people have said about them before, the cases, you know, how strong the cases are concerned. But our strength is, as you'll know from, if you've seen all yesterday's, our strength is speculative artwork, speculative renditions. So we decided to really, you know, really run with this. We want to depict cryptids as if they are definitely real animals. Already we've released a few pieces of artwork. This is John's beautiful painting of some Himalayan yetis in their summer coats with dense rhododendron bushes and Mount Everest in the past. An image clearly depicting, um, a, a, this, this image must be depicted a few decades in the past because the Himalayas don't look like that now. There's no, there's no, no, not that much snow and ice there right now. Uh, John has also produced this brilliant picture of Carcaracles megalodon, megatooth shark, or megalodon, and of course, yes, uh, we, we did deliberately release this in time for that god-awful Discovery Channel fake Um uh, That's kind of a pretty pointless picture that John did that shows the entire cover of the Cryptozoologian covered up by a sheet. That uh, The Cryptozoologian com comes out in 2013, and I, I hope many people here will be interested in it and will check it out. I want to make the point that on tetrapod zoology, yeah, I've written about dinosaurs and speculative zoology and um, big sexy animals, but I've also written about obscure lizards and frogs and boring rodents and rabbits. Rabbits are, I think, the weirdest creatures probably uh, on the earth at this point in time. And there's a whole list of people I've got to thank, you know, Mark Whitten, my collaborator on pterosaurs, done so much with him, uh, good old Steve-O. Um, for, well done to him for doing the, Steve Batchel for doing the, the, the forward for the Tech Wars Audio Book 1, and of course my lovely wife Tony, and Emma does not look like that now. Um, Memo and John and Sarah and Matt and Mike and Bernie and uh, Phil and many other people helped. Um, Self-promotion, yeah, I'm doing some self-promotion at books. Uh, I've got copies of that and that and that and that here, please come and have a look, I didn't bring that, should have done. Copies of Tech Wars Audio Book 1 I think are on sale at the uh, CFZ store, I think I mentioned that. Tetrapod Zoology currently hosted at Scientific American. Uh, you can just Google Tetrapod Zoology and you'll find it. John and myself also do the podcast. We've only done 10 episodes so far. The most recent episode was pretty much devoted entirely to Pacific Rim, which I've seen twice and I will be seeing again. I quite like it. And did I mention there's a book called Tetrapod Zoology, book one? Um, and I'm very sorry for a, a, a bizarre and rushed and messy and strange uh, hour long set of ramblings. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Darren, Darren, I hope you'll forgive me if I don't take questions because we are running quite a lot of it at my fault plate. However, Darren has got books for sale here and out on the stall and I'm sure he will sign them for you. And we are also and we are also running at this point of time totally, um, what's the word when you make it up and you go along? Ad lib. No, 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 no. Improvise. No, you said the word to me earlier, David, and I can't remember what it was. Extemporizing. Extemporizing! Exactly, thank you. We are extemporizing this because 
In the audience, we have, I also have my good friend Carl Schuper, who turned up at the blue and I wasn't expecting him today. So, we have some Carl Schuper. I actually thought you were coming tomorrow, Carl. I had no idea. I thought you were coming on Sunday, I've got no idea. So, we have Darren signing his books. Jojo, would you like to go out and get Darren's books from the stall? So, we have the Darren Nace Superstore. We have the Carl Schuper Superstore. And then Pat Emerson has got a bag full of odds and salts. He has some book, what was the book? Hunt? Misconceptions. We have a load, have you still got some? Yeah. And you've got other odds and sorts in your bag tonight. Inferno and some of Ancient Mariner. So, between us, this is, you can either go out and have a drink for the next half hour, or you can spend your money at the Darren Nage Superstore, the Hunt Emerson Superstore, and the Dr. Schuker has delights. <laughs> In the meantime, David, could you put some music on? I did make a request for the unfact singing, singing of Robert Wyatt earlier. And everybody always does not let me play Robert Wyatt this weekend, but I'm afraid why. Let me be... be